we should probably get started officially now. Thank you for sharing those, uh, those remarks. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anita Kassoff, and I'm the director of the Baltimore Museum of Industry. I am so happy to welcome you all this evening as we come together with the Reginald F. Lewis Museum to bring you this discussion about the experiences of black workers at Bethlehem Steel Sparrows Point Mill. The discussion is inspired by Sparrows Point, an American Steel Story, our new limited edition podcast series about Bethlehem Steel's impact on Baltimore. We feel so fortunate to have joined with WYPR and the incomparable Aaron Hankin to produce the podcast and to be partnering with the Lewis Museum this evening. Partnerships like these are a great example of how Baltimore's anchor institutions can up our games and bring you all even better programs to work together. The Sparrows Point podcast is part of the Baltimore Museum of Industry's Bethlehem Steel Legacy Project, which is a multi-year initiative achieved in partnership with Trade Point Atlantic that includes preservation of historic artifacts and photos from the Beth Steel Mill, community outreach and engagement, and a series of exhibitions about the steel industry and the people who work there. I think the podcast episode about civil rights at Sparrows Point was the most powerful in the series, and it inspired a bonus episode in which Aaron interviewed Eddie Barty Jr. about growing up in the shadow of the mill and working at the mill. And that's why I'm so very grateful to tonight's distinguished panelists for coming together this evening to tell, about, tell us about what it was like to live and work at the point before, during, and after the civil rights era, both the struggles as well as the joys and triumphs and, and the sense of community. Uh, programs like tonight, tonight's are made possible thanks to the generosity of people like you who support Baltimore's museums. If you'd like to find more out more about becoming a member of the BMI or the Lewis, I encourage you to visit our respective websites. Your support will help ensure that museums like ours, which rely on member and donor support, can continue to engage people in, in important conversations like the one we're going to have tonight. Um, just a few bits of housekeeping before we begin tonight's presentation. This discussion is being recorded and it'll be posted on the BMI's YouTube channel in the coming days. Your camera and microphone are turned off, but we welcome your participation. Please use the Q&A feature along the bottom of your screen to submit questions. If you're having any technical difficulties, let us know in the chat function. Um, we anticipate the discussion will wrap up by 8 p.m. And now it is my absolute pleasure to welcome and introduce the new director of the Reginald F. Lewis Museum, Terry Freeman. Terry, welcome to the Baltimore Museum community. We are really looking forward to working with you and to collaborating with you and your team in the months and years to come. Thank you, Anita. Um, thank you so much for inviting us to be a part of this incredible program this evening. I know it is gonna be very interesting. I've had the opportunity to listen in to the conversation that our panelists were having amongst themselves and it was fascinating. I just wanna remind people that uh, the Lewis does have exhibits about Sparrows Point and Bethlehem Steel. And so we invite you to come down and visit us and re-familiarize yourself with those exhibits. But now my job is to introduce our facilitator and host for this evening, Mr. Aaron Hankin. Aaron has done a six part podcast on Sparrow's Point, an American Steel Story, but he has produced a lot of other programs, including a neighborhood documentary called Out of the Blocks and Smithsonian's Folkways recording series, Tapestry of the Times. His stories have aired nationally on NPR's Morning Edition, all Things Considered, uh, PRI, Studio 360, and The World. But he's here with us on WYPR. So I'm going to hand it off to Aaron and thank each of the panelists for participating this evening. Thank you. Thank you for the, the kind introduction. Uh, it's great to, to be here this evening. This is an awesome program. I'm really looking forward to introducing you to the special guests we've got lined up for tonight's panel. Uh, I'll just say I myself over the past year have become completely fascinated by the history of Sparrows Point uh, in the process of producing this, this podcast uh, with, in partnership with the Baltimore Museum of Industry. This is a, it's obviously an important historical topic, but I got to say it's just also a really 
captivating story in and of itself. Um, and so some of you in the audience uh, this evening, you may be experts on the story of Sparrow's Point and Bethlehem Steel. You may probably know more about it than me. Some of you may be relatively new to this uh, chapter of history, uh, like I was when I started out on the podcast. So I'm going to start with a quick walkthrough of the general arc of the story, which covers, you know, obviously a big 126 plus year chunk of history. Uh, and I'm going to give you the super fast five minute Cliff's Notes version of this so we can get on to talking with our excellent guests. Uh, and while I do this, uh, I'm going to play a couple of brief audio clips along the way to give you a taste of some of the different kinds of voices uh, that you hear in this, this podcast series. Um, we start things off on the podcast with kind of a listener immersion experience, I guess you could say, where we get to hear firsthand from former steelworkers what it was like to lace up their work boots and to you know, go into the blast furnace or the hot strip mill and do a day's work. It was incredible. Just the, the smoke, the heat, the sulfur, the dust, the noise. They put me on the blast furnace the second I was there and I almost quit. It was like fighting a fire. From here, we travel back in time to the origins of uh, Sparrows Point, and we kind of trace the growth of this place that was destined to become, you know, the biggest steel mill in the world. And we ask, how did this swampy peninsula on the Patapsco River get picked as the site for this revolutionary state-of-the-art steel mill? And uh, by the way, what was there first? There was just one house on it, a house of an old ship captain, and Captain Fitzel liked his isolated spot because it reminded him of being out at sea. And they began building around 1888. So from the origins of Spiros Point, we fast forward to the mid 20th century, and we zoom in on the advent of unions and uh, also uh, the issue of race relations at the mill. Uh, a unionized workforce was never part of the company's original plan. Uh, and honestly, racial equity was not part of that plan either for that matter. It took until World War II before the plant was unionized. And it wasn't really until the 1970s that Bethlehem Steel was forced to desegregate its job classifications. The fight for worker rights and racial justice really was an uphill battle. And it was interesting just to see how they went to the Justice Department and they would lobby to make changes. So it would be two, three buses. When you filled that room up, you would get people's attentions. In the 1970s, Bethlehem Steel was actually forced by federal consent decree to start hiring women uh, in all operational departments. And uh, at Sparrow's Point, there was this brave generation of female steel workers who first walked in through the doors and they stepped into a work environment that was, you know, crass, it was sexist, and it was oftentimes openly hostile to their presence. I can remember them hanging out of the cranes and hollering at us. And I say, who ruled this world? Girls, girls, and kept on walking. Now, by the mid 20th century, Bethlehem Steel was the biggest steel company in the US. It was an industrial giant. It just seemed too powerful to fail. Uh, but in 2001, it declared bankruptcy. And uh, that just decimated a lot of retirees' pensions and health benefits. And uh, we take an episode in the in the series to dive in and examine how that empire collapsed and we, we bear witness to the, the aftermath. The world caught up to us and we did not change. When I think of Bethlehem Steel, I think about the Roman Empire and I think how industrial royalty became, well, right now it's dust. So finally, we bring things up to the present day and uh, we look at the shift at Sparrows Point away from manu manufacturing to distribution jobs and um, the overall decline of union power. And we ask questions like, what does the story of Sparrows Point have to teach us today? What can the ghost of this now gone steel mill tell us about an uncertain economic future? When you're successful, you can't get complacent. You have to keep evolving. And if you don't, our free market system says you won't survive. Now that's obviously a uh, hyper accelerated tour through the twists and turns of Sparrows Point's history. Uh, if you really want to get into it, you can find the, the podcast, Sparrows Point podcast on the uh, Baltimore Museum of Industry's website. Each episode is about 40 minutes long. The series really goes into, I think, some nice depth and nuance 
on all these points throughout the, the larger history of the mill. And uh, this series, I think, really succeeds entirely based on the, the strength of the experiences and insights of the different voices you hear throughout, um, which is a, a perfect segue to our guests tonight, actually, some of whom you, you hear in the series, some of whose voices you just heard. Uh, we've got with us this evening uh, three fantastic voices of uh, experience from the Sparrows Point era. We have with us Andrew Morton, uh, Ernestine Scott, and Eddie Barty Jr. And um, I'm going to spend about the next half hour or so giving each of our guests an opportunity to, to share their stories, their insights on life in and around the mill. And uh, then I'm going to open the things up to you, uh, our audience, this evening to ask any questions you might have for our guests. And again, you can, you can type your questions uh, whenever you're so inspired into the, the, the uh, chat feature. Actually, there, there's a Q&A feature on this virtual platform. Um, and so if you want to go ahead and put your questions in there, we will get to them. And, uh, and I look forward to your thoughts. Okay, uh, first up, I want to introduce you to Andrew Morton, uh, who I had the pleasure of interviewing for the Sparrows Point podcast. Mr. Morton, let me ask you to uh, introduce yourself, say a bit about your long history as a steel worker, decades long, uh, from when you first came on to the labor gang in uh, 1970, to the kind of groundbreaking training work you were eventually doing by the later years in, in your career. Uh, my name is Andrew Morton. I started Bethlehem Steel June 25th, 1970, in Oscar Hall's labor gang. Now, what the labor gang was, it was a feeder unit for the blast furnace department. Now, Bethlehem Steel was actually broken down into two parts. It was actually broken down into the, the steel, uh, steel side and the finishing side. Steel side is where they actually made steel, and that's where you all your hot, hot jobs were at. And that was the blast furnace, the coke ovens, blooming mill, open herb. Those were your hot jobs. But most of the people that got hard during that time period being black were all sent over that over to that side because where they had an unwritten rule that said blacks could handle heat better than whites. So they sent us all over to, to the uh, blast furnace. The labor gang was a feeder unit to the blast furnace. Now I almost quit, but um, the guys on the blast furnace took me under their wing and they saw a skinny little kid and they made a man out of him. They taught me about life. They taught me um, how to survive on the, on the blast furnace because you had to have people like that teaching you because if not, you would not survive. Now I've lost some of, some of my friends working there. I lost about five people were killed there. Mm -hmm. So I stayed in the blast furnace department I did every job, worked all the way up to the top jobs. I was a keeper on number eight. Then I decided to transfer to the Coke ovens. Once I transferred to the Coke ovens, the Coke ovens did the same thing. The guys took me into the wing and they taught me all the jobs. And I wound up working all the top jobs. Well, during that time period, I started seeing a decline. They had started tearing down blast furnaces and they started shutting down Coke ovens. Because at one time, there were 10 blast furnaces called Blast Furnace Row. Then they started getting rid of five and six and went down. And I saw handwriting on the wall. Now, I didn't know too much about uh, the, the finishing side. And that's where they make a finished product at. But my general foreman over there at 68 High Strip Mill, I actually worked with him and trained with him on the Coke oven. So I talked with him and he asked me about coming over to the hot strip mill. And I did. But once I got into the hot strip mill, I started seeing a unique thing. There was no communication between operational people, mechanical people, engineers, and yet and still the operational people were the largest unit and they actually ran the mill. But if a problem came up, the operator could not tell the engineer what went down because he didn't truly understand what and how, and how the job was actually done. So during that time period, this was around 95, Bethlehem changed over to ISG. ISG had a new mindset. They wanted a much more professional trained employee. 
they opened up the area colleges with the union that started career development. Once career development started, I started taking classes. In fact, I took the very first class over at Essex Community College called Getting Comfortable with Computers. Well, I found that I had a knack with computers and I loved working with them. So I enrolled in the next class and that was computer repair. And then my instructor, Mr. Lurie, he talked with me and he said, you are very good with computers. Why don't you get take programming? And I thought about it. I said, well, that might not be. He said, look, let me tell you something. Be a programmer, learn to program and learn to write the program because then you can write programs for the users and you will always have a job. So I thought about it. I went back. And then I enrolled and I started taking programming uh, courses. Well, in the process, I brought my very first computer, was an Omega 500. And I started going through the Hotmail and I started looking at the training packages. Now, in the Hotmail, they had one manual for the operators to use that was written by engineers. And this is the training manual. This is the only training manuals that the operators had. So what I decided to do was I decided to write my own training manual. I wrote my own training manual. And then during this process, I was still taking programming languages and I was still getting very, very good with computers. I started talking with the engineers. The engineers started understanding what I was, was, was coming to them about. And they started taking an interest in me teaching them how to operate because they didn't know how to operate. So I started teaching them operations and I started going around and sketching the mill. Now everybody thought I was crazy, but I took a sketch pad to work every day and I started sketching the mill. So eventually I went home and I started designing the actual mill. Once I started designing the mill and I took it back and I talked with the engineers and I got their input and then I started talking with the electrical, got their input. They made a suggestion to me. They said, this is a heck of a uh, thing that you're doing and it's new, it's innovative. Why don't you think about selling it to the company? Well, I thought about it. Then they encouraged me, they boosted me. In fact, guys like Kevin Archer and Dennis Dunn and Bill Bensley, Dave Bryant, they encouraged me to set up a presentation. So I did. I went over to management and I set a presentation over to the main office. And I was competing against two companies, Illustrations and Learnscape. And during the, the presentation, I explained to them, I said, look, I don't want you to deny me because of the color of my skin, but if I have a product that can benefit, then allow me to present it because of my skill. And they thought about what I, I said and they awarded me the contract. So when I went back to, back to work, my superintendent, everybody congratulated me because they said, you know what you just did? And I said, no, they said, you became the first black man in history of Bethlehem Steel to be a union worker. And now you're gonna be paid as an out side contract to design and develop in software. So what I, the first thing that I did was I started creating training manuals in the mill and started make them, making them interactive for the employees. I created all the screens that was on the computer screens, went home, wrote a program that will allow an employee to sit down at the desk and actually run the mill from a computer. He would, he would make the same mistakes as he would as he was actually running the mill. That cut down operator error. Then I started deciding, well, okay, fine. Things started changing in the mill. Management's uh, middle came in. They didn't stay long. Severstall actually stripped the plant and the plant started going down. Well, in 2012, the plant finally met its end because the rest of the world caught up with us. But it did not stop there for the workers themselves because thanks to the union, thanks to Baltimore County, 
it opened up the colleges for us to go and enhance our skills. Well, I, I decided that I was going to enhance my skill. I enrolled at North American and I decided to take up electrical technology. Well, in 2015, I stayed there for two years. In 2015, I graduated with a 4.0 average from there. And I credit management and I credit the union because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't have been able to hold this up and be proud of doing it. Now what I'm in the process of doing because of, I don't want history lost. And what happens is a lot of the workers now are dying out. Bethlehem Steel is, is now Trade Point Atlantic and Amazon down there. In a few years, the legacy of Bethlehem Steel will be lost. What I've decided to do was actually design the whole plant, a VR model of the whole plant. And I'm going to make it interactive where you can actually take an avatar and actually select it and walk through the mill. That's going to be my legacy to the men and women that have sacrificed and made Bethlehem Steel the place that it was. And to the hearts of the men and women that work there, I am grateful. I've I've had the pleasure of uh, seeing your your virtual reality work in progress. It's incredible uh, the level of detail uh, that you've been able to accomplish. And you know, if you go to Mr. Morton's home, he's got those stacks and stacks of drawings. He would, you know, I remember you saying you would go in before your or stay after your shift just to draw every single piece of equipment in the mill down to the different bolts and uh, components. And you had. You had a sweetheart at the time who got jealous because you were spending more time with at the mill than you were with her. I remember you telling, "I could we could spend a whole hour with you, Mr. Morton, but I'm gonna just I'm gonna keep just to keep us on track. I'm gonna I'm gonna move next to um, next up. I want to introduce you all to uh, Ms. Ernestine Scott. Her uh, she's here actually to talk uh, well about herself, but also about her father, uh, John Washington. He was a crane operator at the mill from, if I have this correctly, 1944 to 1983. He passed away in February. Uh, but Ms. Scott is here to talk about her dad's chapter of history at the mill. Uh, Ms. Scott, I understand um, he, he made some history uh, in the crane operating department at the tin mill. Yeah, I'd love for you to share his story with us. Uh, good evening. Um... It is truly an honor. Uh, when my dad passed away at age 98 in February, um, it, this project for us began with trying to decide how we wanted to honor him because he was a very, very quiet man. He didn't like fanfare. And we decided that a funeral would not really be what he wanted. We didn't even want to have a memorial service, but it started out with me trying to write an obituary that was befitting him and I had to do some research because there were things that I did not know. I contacted a Mr. Barry, who is a historian and writes uh, about Bethlehem Steel. And he put me in touch with one of the mentees that my father had uh, mentored. And through him, I learned many things. I learned that my father was one of the first black crane operators on the 10 mill side. Uh, he was very proud of that. Uh, it's almost embarrassing sometimes we go to the doctor and it was the first thing he would tell people. I was the first black crane operator. It was, uh, you'd hear it all the time, but it, it was something that he was proud of. He, he had a very limited education and uh, he did his job well. He knew he did it well. And I think it was the one thing that really, really cemented for him that he, he made something of himself. Um, Ms. Scott, you, um, I read your father's obituary, and uh, in it, you share a story about the plant having to close one day because uh, the workers, the white workers, refused to work with a black man. You said uh, he often suffered the indignities of racism, but his priority was making a decent living to care for his family. Um, let me ask you to talk a bit more about... Um, the the environment, the racial environment that he was immersed in during his day. This was before consent decrees uh, came along, and 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 some of the racial barriers that he faced just in his day to day work. 
there, um, um, I was told by my brother, because I'm a bit older, I had left home and my brother was telling me a story that my dad said to him that there was a few occasions when he went to work and looked in his locker and somebody had placed them, sadly, a dead carcass of, uh, of an animal in his locker and said, uh, left a note, this could be you. Um, I, as I got older, my father took a flight, uh, I'm not ashamed to say, into alcohol for a while. And as a child, you don't understand why that happens. But now that we're older, uh, we talk about it. We said, he didn't, he wasn't able to go to human resources back then. He didn't have anybody who could champion for him. So maybe his way of coping was about the cook, to have to go to work to hostility every day when you're just trying to feed your family. I can't imagine what it must have been like. And so I think that's probably why he did drink. And fortunately, he turned it around and probably stopped drinking about, you know, 40 years ago. So, but it was a painful time for him. Let me ask you to um, talk a bit about your own childhood, Ms. Scott, as the daughter of a steel worker. What was it like for you growing up at that time and in that community? Um, my dad worked hard. My grandfather also worked there. My father actually followed my grandfather to Bethlehem Steel. Um, some of the happy times I can always remember, there was... Um, there was a barbecue place there. Uh, it was called Mickey's. We weren't allowed to stay up very late, but on Thursday nights, my dad got paid because he normally worked in the evening. So he worked, um, I think it was three to 11. So my mother would let us stay up late because he would stop at Mickey's and he would bring us barbecue sandwiches. And we waited like, that was our big thing on the week, weekend, wait for him to get paid. And we could stay up late and he would bring us sandwiches. So that's, those are happy times I couldn't remember. Um, I also remember he was absolutely good at his job. He was, um, he was home one evening cutting grass. He was off and the plant called. Uh, they wanted him to come in. There was something wrong. They couldn't do it. They sent a car for him to come to work. And he said, if he came in, they would pay him the salary and so forth. And uh, somebody came, picked him up and stopped cutting the grass. He went to the plant. So, he evidently was doing a good job. He did have something to be proud of, but it was not easy for him. Um, in his later years, he became somewhat reclusive, didn't, didn't reach out to a lot of people. And I, I think it, a lot of it had to do with uh, some of the things that he went through. He didn't trust a lot of people, didn't like to socialize. Um, he lived in a senior building, didn't like to participate in much of anything. He just kind of stayed to himself. You know, a lot of the steel workers that I've met and talked to, um, it kind of became clear to me that this was a job that really became one and the same as your identity. When, you know, when you, when you were worked in that plant, you didn't just have a job at that plant. You were a steel worker. Like that's who you were. That wasn't your job. It kind of became who you were. And it sounds like your dad, I mean, you mentioned him talking about it so much. You got embarrassed about it as a kid. <laughs> But talk about how much that job meant to him and his, his identity, who he was as a person. Well, it was important because, you know, as a black man, there were not a lot of places that you could get a job, especially an uneducated man. My father probably had less than an eighth grade education. Uh, he came to um, work because he needed to help. Uh, he used to do nothing but farm work, but he liked to come and see if he could make a better living to help take care of the family. Um, his job did enable us. We did was able to buy a home, which he was very proud of. Um, he was, you know, he worked hard. It wasn't easy work. He often said how difficult it was. He told me once that in the summertime, when he was working, it was so hot there. He said, "Oh, I'll, I'd be in the crane in just my underwear." He said that's how uncomfortable it was, and that's what I had to do. But I mean, he went to work. Uh, he rarely missed time. Uh, when he was finally able to retire, he was like a lot of the people. I think they gave him the 13 weeks vacation first, and then he was able to retire. But he did identify with that, that that was the thing he did to take care of his family, no matter what to do to do that job. Out of curiosity, but last question for you, and I'm going to introduce to Mr. Barty, but I'm curious 
like after working that many decades, when retirement happened, how did your dad adjust to that? It was uh, I imagine he was looking forward to it, but then all of a sudden, this job that's kind of your entire existence just isn't there. Like, what did he do with himself once he retired? Well, it wasn't hard. Baseball, fishing. Loved to fish. Uh, he loved to watch the games. Uh, he used to, uh, they would hire, you know, he'd do like the, um, he'd go to Deal Island where several men, you hire a boat to take you out for the day. He'd come back with a large haul he, all day long. He's busy cleaning fish. He just loved it. That's what, that's what he liked to do. He was an avid, um, though he said he hated them, he had a love-hate relationship with the Orioles and the Ravens. And um, <laughs> he always said he didn't like them, but he was always in a baseball cap with the Orioles and so forth. So he adjusted well to, um, I think, retirement. I never heard him say he wanted to go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to say, he's... Um... You do him an honor today uh, to tell his story and remember him. He's lucky to have you here to tell that story. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to want to go ahead and uh, move things along here and introduce you next to a, a gentleman I've I've gotten to know well over the past year, uh, Mr. Eddie Barty Jr. He has a, a lifelong history that's totally intertwined with Sparrows Point. He worked at the plant himself for many years, and uh, his father. Uh, whose name you've already heard mentioned this hour, Eddie Barty Sr. was a pioneering union leader during the civil rights era. Mr. Barty, let me have you maybe start by rewinding to your childhood. Paint a picture of what life was like in the, in the company town of Sparrows Point, in your neighborhood, on your block, and, and maybe talk about the kind of organizing work that you saw your dad doing as you were growing up. Okay, I have uh, probably a three part tear there because basically we can always speak about the community of Spurs Point. And the community of Spurs Point consists of I and J Street, which is a really tight coalition community. What I learned from that community was the guys that worked at Spurs Point and lived in the rental properties at the point, they treated those homes just like they were theirs. They they had great yards. They had great brotherhood. They were uh, a strong community a church spiritual community. Uh, they they stuck together, and uh, I thought that was uh, pretty pretty proud to watch the guys as I become into the steel industry. That was friends of mine. Their their fathers actually helped carry me through, and also as me living on Spurs Point, looking at these steel mills from the age of two years old to seventeen year old. I uh, always often what was behind, wondering what was behind the wall. And I got hired at 18. And I got hired in 1974. When I got hired, my dad was the vice president of the union. And when we were younger, we watched our dad go through rallies right there on Spurs Point, where they just had platforms put up. And guys would come around, man, because of us living on Spurs Point, guys from the point, guys from the mills, and they would actually have protesters going on for different reasons of why they want to protest against the company, whether it was racial or whether it was a labor disagreement or anything of that nature. The interesting part was my dad, man, was a, he was an encyclopedia by himself as far as the community, as far as the uh, steel industry, as far as the union. He started in 1955, the year I was born. My dad did 36 years in the union between president and vice president. He retired in 1996. He was one of the first founders of the Steelworkers Credit Union, which is still existing today. And he stayed there until he died. That was 50 years of service in the Steelworkers Credit Union, which is now member's first credit union. He was always an advocate for, for the community and for the church. And I mean, as uh, Mr. Morton said, the finishing side of the plant was mostly the white side of the plant. And dad worked in the 10 mill. And dad came up through the ranks of the 10 mill. And somewhere down the line, like you say, he did get a high school education from Silas Point High School. And just because of the fact that he was always business-minded, moved forward. Him and Mr. Lee Douglas, man, they were pioneers on that union floor. And when it's 1962, dad was in, elected the first vice president of Local 2609, 
1971, he was elected the first black president in 1971. So his career as a union man that went through all the Jim Crow stuff from the 50s all the way up to the point of his retirement was phenomenal because, I mean, um, it's really hard to put all that in a short period of time to even speak about. Me living on Spurs Point, Spurs Point to me, just like anybody that lived on Spurs Point, to live, to live on Spurs Point was an ideal place to live at one time because of all the stuff that's going on in the world today. It was a very safe environment and it was full of love and it was full of people sharing and caring about one another. And, and that's the thing about Spurs Point that, that when we get together as a community and have Spurs Point reunions, it's like everybody felt like brothers and sisters. Everybody felt like kinfolk. There were more kinfolk on Spurs Point because a lot of people that integrated from the South, their brothers and their sisters came up as well to get jobs or their brothers married people from the South. I know I, I've seen an example, Ricky Glenn, he had his grandmother that he was raised with. He had his mother. Then he had his great grandparents that live on Spurs Point. I'll take uh, uh Harry Pugh, he lived right across the street from his grandparents directly. So, I mean, there's so many people about me calling a whole lot of names. And I want to get one more name up. Mr. Taz Statham. Mr. Taz Statham became the first black general foreman on the steel side in the Riggers department. And Mr. Taz Statham, he started way back before my dad. He was older than my dad. But he became a general foreman back in like the 60s. And Mr. Taz Statham had five kids. And he sent all his kids to college off of Bethlehem Steel's money. So uh, I look at some of the bright sides of the things that happened with the people as far as point. When I look at the, my parents that I work with, I watched everybody involved to move up to the higher jobs uh, in the mechanical department, an the electrical department, the crane, millwright department, foremans, rollers, operators, crane operators, operators of the mill. So those are the things that I look at to say that I know that the, the legacy started with the lag work of what the union did from the guys of 2610, like Ivy Dennis, and, and uh, who was a president, uh, Walter Scott, Joe Butler, you just name it going forward. Um, G.I. Johnson, all these guys, man, were great leaders in the union that moved things forward. And along with the fact that they went to Annapolis to fight the battle between equality for black people, even though in 1964, the civil rights was passed by the federal government, but it really didn't take place really heavily until in the 70s. So just like Mr. Borton said, in the 70s, when we came in, all the black signs and white signs were taken down. Now with the black bathrooms, was a female bathroom and, and, and a men's bathroom. And the, the locker rooms, it used to be a point where the whites and the blacks didn't go into the same bathhouse. But now they mixed everything. And same thing with the restaurant. So things began to off of our, our, our black workers all the way around. And even with the money. When you turn around and look at it and say, I didn't have a problem with if I learned the job, that I got paid the same thing the next guy got paid. And like you say, I, I worked in probably almost every department in the point. I mean, from the pipe mill, the rod and wine mill, the plate mill the coke, um, the blast furnace, no matter where I went at, whatever the job classification was, is what I got paid. But I give that credit to my forefathers, including my dad and the rest of them, that united together and made a strong front to protest so the upcoming people can move forward to get a better job within the union. And that that was that was monumental for us. That, that mean, that it was great. Now, even though I was a union official, even though I was chairman of civil rights, even though there was still discrimination, even to the point of the time that we actually retired in 2012, they were still trying to deny people to move up. I had a case over in the steel making side. I had a guy that was a union official named uh, Mr. Bort, and uh, they were leapfrogging junior employees over top of him. And we had to go in and sit down with labor relations and, and, and on it out and get them back pay money and move them forward. So it was always something with corporate America that always wanted to keep their fist or their hand or their knee on black people so they wouldn't move up. So we consistently had to have that fight. We always had racial tension, not as bad as it used to be when my grandfather was there, when my dad was there. 
but you always have racial tension because one of the things that Spurs One had, the superintendents were white. The superintendents' kids came to Spurs Point. The superintendents white, they became white hats and they moved up. It was, um, I, I don't know how, it was some type of French connection or Italian connection, any way you want to look at it. A lot of your management, hard their own people, brother-in-laws, son-in-laws and things of that capacity. And they got top-notch jobs. And that's the kind of way the company ran. And I looked at that because I worked in the plate mill and I had a, a, a Gary Corden was my, I'm not, Mr. Taylor was my superintendent in the plate mill. His son went to college for engineering. His name was Steve Taylor. He ended up being my superintendent in the cold sheet mill. So I watched the way that the company evolved by moving their family members up. And I watched the way that also dealing with the union, sometimes we had to fight the union just for Han practice because the Han practice was lopsided. And we had to fight with our own union to say, look, man, you see that the company is hiring more whites than they are blacks. And what's the problem with that? So we, we had to fight. We, we always had a fight on our hands. The fight never stopped. It wasn't as bad as it was in the 50s. It wasn't as bad as it was in the 60s and the 70s. It got a little bit better. But you never could let your attention go away from the fact that think everything was going to be even across the board. So basically, again, go ahead, Aaron. I think that living in the community, being able to go into these mills and watch the forefathers that I grew up with took me under their wings and just helped me become the guy that I was. And of course, my hero always will be my own dad because of the fact that I watched this guy on the union floor, I mean, fight with tooth and nails for the people. So that was the blessing right there. I... Uh... I want to just take a quick minute, Mr. Barty, and and just thank you uh, publicly for a, f a phone call I got from you after a, an episode of our podcast series came out. It was it was the episode about unions and civil rights, uh, and you were featured in that episode. And you rang me up uh, after you heard the episode, and you you called me out on a on a blind spot I wasn't aware I had. You said when when white folks, case in point, me, when white folks talk about the struggle for black workers at Sparrows Point. They always seem to focus on the part about how black workers had the hardest, dirtiest jobs, but that not enough gets said about the successes they had in later years at the plant. I was grateful for that call, as you know, and uh, you and I ended up, we ended up doing an extra bonus episode in the series where, where we talked about just that issue. Um, so let me just give you a chance briefly here to talk about some of those successes in later years at the plant, some of those black workers who really distinguished themselves in leadership. Of course, like I was telling you for a good example, uh, when we first was talking early on, I me mean, living on Spurs Point, I give you an example. Mr. Prince Rollins, I was probably about 16 or 17 years old. And probably back then, it was uh, maybe even later than that. It might have been like 68. He was, a, he was a foreman over on the steelmaking side. And Mr. Johnny Young, he was a foreman on the steelmaking side. Now, this didn't mean anything to me when I was 14, 15 years old, okay? Now, as a result of that, like I said, um, when I went into steelmaking and I seen Mr. Johnny Young, and, I, and when I say, you know what? That I, I had no idea exactly what I was walking into. So when you recognize when you walk into a steel industry at 18 years old or 19 years old, anywhere that time, and you start looking around and you see people that was a part of your community and the way they involved and moved up before all the things that people were saying about, hey, that the Blacks only had the lowest paying jobs and the dirtiest hot jobs. So even on the opposite side, which was the finishing side. When I worked in the Rod and Wine Mill, my dad's buddy name was Joe Saunders. Joe Saunders was the chairman of the grievance committee for 2609. Him and dad used to sit on the front porch and talk all the time. They were the two most powerful guys in the union to make policy for the union to change things within the company. So those are, those are the things when I say there's, there's people that don't get recognition for their efforts within the union or either within the company 
because we don't get a chance to talk about it. And like I was talking about Mr. Statham, Mr. Statham was the first black general foreman. And that was way in the sixties when that happened. So these, these are the guys that I look at, man, to say that were uh, icons. These were the guys that I knew personally from living in the community and understanding the fact once I worked in, in the steel mill to see these guys involved. Now we also can look on the union side of things like I was telling you about how things involved there. Like Mr. Burke Dixon became a black president of 2609. 2609 was the Rod Mill, Pipe Mill, Tin Mill, Hot Mill, that, and, and the Cold Sheet Mill. Now this, this is the finishing side of the plant. This side was basically, like I told you, literally white. So Mr. Ben Hamlet was a, a, a zone man over there in the, uh, in the, tin, in the uh, Hot Mill. And uh, Bill Ruffin was the first black over there in the Tin Mill to my knowledge and Mike Bassettville. So when these guys move up, man, that's a big statement to be able to represent your department that's more white than it is black. Let me read you guys some uh, comments and some questions from uh, from the audience. Uh, they've been uh, filling up the chat and the Q&A here. I'm just going to read through some of these. Uh, good evening. My name is Philip. I'm from uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. My former pastor of my church and my late great uncle, uh, uh, and my late third cousin all worked at Bethlehem Steel at Sparrows Point, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, Joy says, Mr. Eddie, I've known uh, him and his family all my life. Awesome, Mr. Barty. Uh, awesome legacy, Mr. Morton. Uh, we have listeners whose grandparents worked at the, at the plant. Um, kudos uh, to Ms. Ernestine's dad. He was an overcomer. What a legacy. Um, what here's a question what do folks know about the fairfield shipyards especially during the jim crow era interested in hearing more about fairfield right so for those who are not uh, that familiar with the history of bethlehem steel there was a huge part of the mill that was building ships especially around the era of world war ii um you guys didn't work in the shipyards proper, but you can probably speak on it more better better than I can. What, what do you, uh, uh, Mr. Barty, Mr. Morton, um, thoughts, commentary on the shipyards? Well, one of the, uh, before I even went to, to Sparrows Point, when I graduated from high school, I actually applied at the shipyard. And, uh, what, and I also applied to shipyard on Key Highway. Well, me and a Bunch of my buddies, we got together and went down to Sparrows Point the same week. And that same week, we were hired there. If it wasn't for that, I would have worked in the shipyard, uh, especially over at Key Highway. And so that was my, my only experience uh, working with um, over the shipyard or getting to me with the shipyard. Let me, uh, let me read a couple more uh, thoughts. Um, thank you for all your stories. My grandfather, Robert D. Thomas, worked there for a long time, lived in Turner Station. Thanks for revisiting both challenging and loving memories. Uh, uh, let's see here. Walt says, my father, Walter, uh, was a union leader, crane operator at Bethlehem Steel from the early 50s through the mid-60s who led a strike preventing uh, the train from delivering coal. He went up against uh, President Sweeney and Jimmy Hoffa, who had stolen a large amount of money from his crew in court, which was awarded uh, some of their money in return. Uh, he was threatened with his life one night. Wow. There's so many people uh, have so many stories of their own. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, here's a nice comment um, that says, I think Ms. Scott's father would be smiling. That's a comment from you, Ms. Ernestine. Uh, this is fascinating. I did not know any of this. Huge part of Baltimore's history. Amazing legacy. So great. There's a project to preserve it. Um, I appreciate Mr. Barty speaking about the unions. It seems like the decimation of unions has adversely impacted workers across all industries. I'm wondering if Mr. Barty or Mr. Morton could speak more about how corporate America sucked workers dry without strong unions to hold them accountable. Uh, in the steel industry and especially uh, black laborers. I mean, the union fight and the civil rights uh, fight were, they went hand in glove, didn't yes, they? Yes, they really did. I mean, basically when you say that, um, we had the opportunity to move up and I'm quite sure 
the forefathers before us didn't have the opportunity to move up. The union became more powerful. The union became more connected to the government. So the company had to honor some of the things that was going on, as you know, with the incentive degree and things going forward. So that gave me and Andrew a stronger opportunity to move up. I mean, uh, like I say, I mean, I was in the union. I was chairman of civil rights. I was financial secretary. I was treasurer. I was auditor. I was a shop steward. So all that came from the legacy of my dad, because like you say, just being around him and learning things from him, I moved forward to do things. But one of the key things is when we when we look at put all this into one nutshell, we recognize the fact that we had our benefits paid for, our health care benefits paid for. We we had our pensions and all that was going forward prior to uh, things going south. So we had great benefits and uh, it was all because of the union. I mean, they striked in 1956, when is Andrew, 56? Uh, for so many days just to have health care benefits. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me ask you, uh, Ms. Scott, if you, uh, uh, in your um, research about your dad and his era uh, at uh, the mill, which was slightly earlier than uh, Mr. Barty and Mr. Morton, um, he was a union man, of course, I imagine, because the, you know, uh, the, the, the Sparrows Point was unionized around the time of World War II. Um, but the, con the consent decree that Mr. Barty is referring to, that didn't happen till, when did you say, Mr. Barty? 74. 74. Oh. Yeah, 74. And this consent decree basically was, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, what it said was the mill can no longer keep workers um, bound to only their unit seniority, that it, basically what would happen is that historically black workers would get funneled into the lowest paying jobs. And, and so you could maybe get seniority within that department, but you, that didn't count. Plant seniority overall um, was, it was, there was an inequity there because you could only get seniority within the, the unit that you worked in. Am I am I explaining that right? Yeah, yes. but well, unit seniority was um, if you wasn't in the, if you had ten years in the union in the unit, and I came into the department and I wanted to move into that unit, and I had twenty years, I couldn't move up. the 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 junior person would always move over ahead of me because they had seniority called unit seniority right. in that unit. That's how it okay. worked. And that was a form of discrimination, so, especially over, they did use that over steel side, um, but it wasn't prevalent on the blast furnace because a lot of people didn't want to work the blast furnace because of the danger and the, and the heat. Ms. Scott, do you know uh, much about your uh, the different jobs that your dad worked within the uh, within the plant, within uh, Sparrows Point, he obviously uh, was a crane operator at one point, and that was a groundbreaking job for him. Being a crane operator is all he ever talked about. I'm not aware of him doing anything else. I just know that he worked on the steel side within the tin mill, and he okay. never described anything else. I think that's what he did the whole time that he was there. We've uh, got a just a couple minutes left. I have. There's an interesting comment here. Um, uh, from uh, someone in the audience who says, uh, not everyone made out so well uh, after uh, Bethlehem Steel closed up. There were people there, there were people still looking for employment, even up to a few years ago. Uh, a lady came in, a lady came to interview whose last job was at Bethlehem Steel. I wonder if you might talk about um, your, your brothers and sisters and that worked. Uh, with you up until the plant closed and, and just sort of what a, what a kind of apocalypse that was psychologically for someone who had dedicated so many decades and to their life to that plant and whose identity was so tied up in, in working there. Well, one of the things was Bethlehem still was like a, a family one. And then two, we had several people that took to depression because of the fact that people lost their homes People lost their cars. People were, weren't able to send their kids to college, had to take kids out of college because of the fact that 
we were making a good pay paycheck at Bethlehem Steel. And it was kind of hard to meet that pay role through any other industry. So we actually have people, that, like I said, that commit suicide. And um, even the whole Southeast end, all the way coming up from Cigna to any, any industry that was affected by the steel industry, it, it was just the truck drivers. I had buddies that drove tractor trailers, man, and they were laid off. Thompson still laid off. Raymond still went down. It was so many different entities that was affected by Bethlehem Steel because they were a roots and branches to so many other businesses. And when you look at your coworkers and some of them had to readjust. And when I know several, I know two or three of them that actually lost their homes, but I also know some that actually survived and they have actually bloomed. They went into the medical field. Some went into their own businesses. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's great to know that some went in better places because of the fact of that even though, even like myself, I went to work for Baltimore County Public School. And uh, if it wasn't for Beth, I, I actually bought three homes because of the money that I, I, I had at Beth, that worked for Bethlehem Steel. So when I say that, you have to look at Mike Lewis, he involved into the, um, the union as far as for the international union. So many people did move up. But when we look at the fact to say, to have that kind of skill and not be able to go somewhere else and use it, people don't understand what was going on in their plant. I mean, from crane operations to being a mechanic to being electricians. And some of that stuff, some guys actually took it to the railroad. Some guys took it to what's on the news now, to um, the sugar plant over there, Domino Sugars. Some people took it to down south, which is um, the shipyard. Some people took it up north to other steel mills. So they understood the environment that they lived in. They understood exactly what that produced for them. So we had the opportunity by the government to go back and go to school for anything you wanted. It, it was part of the career development that they were developing for us. Um, I had my CDLs in the past. When I did go back, I went back and got my CDLs again so I can be able to use them after I let them go. So it was up to a person who retired from Bethlehem Steel at that particular time, just like Andrew. I, I took uh, classes for home inspection. I took classes for the computers. So when I say that, there was things offered to us and there was opportunity the first two to three years after the plant shut down for you to go back to school or to go back and get a train. Yeah. And I see uh, Andrew Morton nodding his head. We're, we're getting close up to the end of the hour, but let me just give you, let you briefly, uh, Andrew, share your, your, your thoughts on that as well. I know you had, when we spoke, you, you talked about that uh, phenomenon of there are those people who uh, can adapt and move on and the others that it's a lot harder for. You know, we're living in a changing society. Technology is, is constantly evolving and taking over. As employees on a job, companies no longer want employees to get 30, 40 years anymore. Also, as, as an employee, you have to be willing to adjust. You have to be willing to re-educate yourself. Education is not limited because you get older. Education is limited when you limit yourself. And it's very important that people understand that the job you work today might not be the same job it is tomorrow. And with technology moving forward, we as humans have to move forward with it to keep up with the technology if we're going to be solvent in life. Because technology is here to stay and it's not going anywhere. So... Education is most key to everything. And I tell young people this all the time. Don't become stagnant on the job. Be willing to train and to learn. One thing that I, I, I wish more companies and unions work together with actually opening up educational processes for their employees to constantly keep evolving with the technology that they are constantly keep striving with. That's, that's really, really, I'm hoping for that for the future. Mr. Morton, uh, I think those are wise words to conclude on. Um, I, um, I guess, uh, you know, I'll, I'll echo our listeners who are saying thank you for this important discussion. Thank you for sharing this. Um, 
you've you've struck a chord. You've got a lot of listeners, uh, people who've joined our our, uh, meet, our session tonight, who've got stories of their own, and I, I think this is probably uh, sparking their memories and really striking a chord with them. So, on behalf of everyone who's who's joined this evening, uh, thank you guys for sh for sharing our guests, uh, Mr. Andrew Morton, Ms. Ernestine Scott, and uh, Mr. Eddie Barty Jr. Thank you guys. Um, I want to say. Thanks also, of course, to the uh, Reginald F. Lewis Museum and the Baltimore Museum of Industry for co-hosting this session this evening. And uh, thank you, all of you who've uh, joined us this hour for the conversation. Glad you could be with us. Um, the uh, I would invite you to um, check out the websites of the Reginald F. Lewis Museum and the uh, website of the Baltimore Museum of Industry. And, um, and check out uh, the Sparrows Point podcast, if I may make a plug, uh, and you're interested in uh, deeper, longer stories about the, the history of the different chapters of uh, the story of, of Sparrows Point. Um, that said, it is always a pleasure hearing stories about Sparrows Point. And uh, thank you. And, and I wish you all, uh, everyone who's uh, on the call, a great night. Thank, thanks so much. All right. Hey. <laughs> See you later, Andrew. All right, there, Barty. <laughs> See you later, Miss Scott. Nice to meet you, Miss Scott. It was nice okay. meeting you too. Have a good night. All right. Thanks, Ern. Be well, everybody. All right, there. The <laughs> I'll be talking with you, Ern. All right. I'll look forward to it. Okay.